The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Are you one of the 47 million Americans who benefit from group insurance? Listen carefully to this special message from Mr. Charles R. Hook, president of the American Rolling Mill Company. Mr. Hook says, In 1917, our company became the first company in the entire steel industry to provide our men and women with the protection of group life insurance. We considered it an investment to increase productivity by reducing worry. Today, all sound industrial relations programs include group life insurance. I wish time permitted me to describe to you just how much it has meant to the many, many families whose provider has passed away during the past 30 years. It would prove to you, as it has to us, the great value of group life insurance. Yes, group insurance is something worth owning. In 14 minutes, the Equitable Life Assurance Society will give further important information about group insurance for both employers and employees. Tonight's FBI file, The Honest Embezzler. Not every one of the more than a million and a half crimes that are committed each year in the United States is important enough to be the subject of banner headlines in your local newspaper. But every crime that violates a federal statute is important enough to be the subject of intense work by every division of your FBI. Sometimes that work is not immediately rewarded. Sometimes the criminal is cautious enough to escape the net prepared for him. But to the FBI, no file is marked closed until the criminal is found. Whether that task takes six weeks, six months, or six years. Tonight's file opens on the grounds of a carnival that's playing in a Midwestern city. In a small tent located behind one of the main attractions on the Midway, we find one of the performers, Lily Fenton, resting on a canvas cot. Fenton? Yeah? Uh, may, may I come in? That you, Pop? Yeah. Yeah, come ahead. Brought you over a pail of coffee. Well, thanks, Pop. A little nip in the air this evening. I I thought you might catch a chill. You're wonderful. <laughs> Tell me something, Pop. What? What's that? How's a nice old guy like you to come to be with a carny? Well, after Lily died... Lily? That was my wife's name, too. No kidding. When she died, I just couldn't stand the house anymore. I, I saw her sitting in every chair. Oh. Here, cut up some of this coffee, will you? No, no, thanks. I, I, I'd better get back to my job. Come on. Well, Here. all right, thanks. Now I know why you're always so nice to me. Well, I'll tell you, Miss Fenton. Why don't you call me Lily? No, I couldn't do that. I couldn't call anybody else, Lily. Oh, I'm sorry. Forgive me. That's all right. You're a real nice girl, Miss Fenton. Thanks, Pop. I wish I really were your Pop. I wouldn't let you work here. Oh, this isn't as bad as it looks. The dough's good, and business is good. It's good tonight, isn't it, Pop? Yes, yes, very good. Oh, it'll still suit me to get out of this town. Too many squares. Hmm? Uh, squares? Yokel. Oh. Still having trouble with carny talk, huh, Pop? Well, I, I'm gradually catching on. Well, don't get too happy. I like you better this way. Hi, Lily. Oh, hello, Marty. 
What are you doing here, Pop? He's well, visiting. Why? Who's taking tickets? Uh, Bob relieved me for a few minutes. I was just going back. Look, finish your coffee. Don't let this guy scare you. No, I'd really better go. Uh, thanks for the visit. Come back any time, Pop. Uh, yes, thank you. Marty, I don't want you to treat Pop like that. Huh? You practically chased him out of here. So what? He's a nice old guy. He's also a scared old guy. What do you mean? He's a lone wolf. Listen, baby, I've been around Carney's long enough to know that kind is on the lamb from something. Oh, stop. Honey, I know. Look at the way he talks, the way he dresses. He could be doing something better than taking tickets with a tent show. Look, for once in your life, will you mind your own business? I just got a yen to find out about him. Marty, lay off. Okay, baby. Whatever you say. <laughs> In an FBI office several hundred miles from the carnival grounds, Special Agent Jim Taylor has been given a case which will eventually lead him to that carnival. Hi there, Jim. Oh, oh hello, Ralph. I thought you were still upstate on that Monroe case. No, we cleaned that one up. I got back last night. What are you working on? Some unfinished business. Oh? Yes, I'm looking for a man named Earl Corey. He was teller at the National Bank. Yes? Disappeared about six months ago. When they examined his books, they found a shortage of over $9,000. Was this just reported? No, we've got a file on it right along. It's just been handed to me. Those are always tough ones. Well, this one's no exception. Any leads at all? Not a one. What's the background on this man, Corey? Well, he was 62 years old. Had been married. Wife died shortly before he disappeared. I see. He lived here all his life. No police record. He'd been with the bank over 30 years. Any motive for the embezzlement? Well, his wife had been ill for several years. He evidently had used the bank funds to cover doctor bills, and then when she died, he ran away. That was foolish. Yes, I know. Would have been far better for him to have stayed and faced the charges. What about relatives or friends? No. They've heard nothing from him. Well, where do you go from here? Well, I've just been playing a little game. A game called, if I were Mr. Corey, what would I do? <laughs> Any results? Nothing sensational, but I do know this. If I'd been a man of regular habits, as Mr. Corey was, and I'd lived here all my life, I think I'd be curious to know what was happening back in my hometown. That makes sense. Now, as far as we know, he hasn't corresponded with anyone. So the logical source of information would be one of our local newspapers. Which he might have had sent to him? That's right. So I'm making the rounds of the papers this afternoon to check up on all out-of-town subscribers. Need any help, Jim? No, not yet, Ralph. This is really just a shot in the dark. If it doesn't work, I'll start off again in another direction. come you're not working this show? My contract says I take off one show a day. This is it. Well, who's on out there? Daisy. Oh, that's kind of a tired routine. And what's with all the clothes? The word came in. Dress up or we're sloughed. Oh. By the way. Yeah? I saw Pop a while ago. He's very grateful for what you did. What was that? Finding his wallet. Oh, well, that was nothing. I just happened to be walking along the midway. Look down. Stop, and... will you? Huh? Who are you kidding? What do you mean? The only reason you returned that wallet is because you had somebody lift it in the first place. Uh, what would I want with that old geezer's pokey? So you could dig who he really is. Now, uh, wait a minute. Marty, wait. don't lie to me. I can always peg it, see? Okay, so I did have it lifted. And? And I was right about him. He gave us a phony handle. His real name is Corey. He used to be a bank teller back in Cleveland. So? So no guy leaves a job like that to take tickets in a carney unless he got in a jam. What difference does that make to you? Honey, it could make a real big difference. How? If he dipped his duke in the till before he left that bank, he could have a bundle buried someplace. If he had a bundle, he wouldn't be working here. Look, them Lamisters do funny things sometimes. He might just be waiting to cool off. And this is a real good spot to do it. Marty, I want you to leave him alone. Now, look, baby, I got a pal in Cleveland. I could have him check up on a guy. If he did take that bank, we could make a real good score. Pop left that job because his wife died. If you try to blow a whistle on him, so help me, I'll fix you good. 
Jim. Oh, Jim. Oh, hello, Ralph. Going back to the office? Yes. Hop in. I'll give you a lift. Fine, thanks. Got a lead on that bank embezzler, didn't you? Yes. How did you know? <laughs> I could tell by the way you were walking down the street you were about two feet off the pavement. <laughs> Well, it was that hundred to one shot that came through, Ralph. You got it from one of the newspapers? That's right. I checked subscriptions for the past six months. I'm practically positive that the handwriting on one of them is Corey's. I'll have it confirmed in the lab. Where is he? Oh, right now he's in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Any address? No, he received the papers care of general delivery. Well, you could have a surveillance set up at the post office there and pick him up. I don't think that'd work in Fort Wayne. Why not? Well, beginning tomorrow, his address will be Lansing, Michigan. He'll be there for a week. I see. Whatever he's doing, he's really been on the move. He spent exactly one week in a whole succession of cities. Did you get a list of these places? Yes. Well, that ought to be a help in determining what sort of work he's doing. Now, I know. But I don't think I'll have to dig into that. I have an idea they'll pick up Mr. Corey at the general delivery window in Lansing. <laughs> Marty, I like that. Matter, Lily? Oh, hiya, Marty. Come on in. What's the beef, kid? I got a hundred more miles to travel on this train, so I settle down here in this compartment for a nice evening of solitaire, and what happens? I win the very first game. <laughs> Is uh, that a box of candy there? Yeah. Help yourself. Okay. Pop give it to you? He did. Why don't you two go steady? I might be better off with him than with you. I hope you did like I told you. You mean about laying off the guy? Yeah. Baby, I'm leaving him strictly alone. Good. Oh, uh, by the way, where is Pop? Back in the baggage car. He turned in. Oh. Want to play some gin? No, I don't think so, honey. I'm kind of restless. I think I'll go out on the platform and grab a smoke. Okay. See you later, huh? Mm-hmm. Ah, not now, Joe. Wait a minute, maybe. Hiya, Pop. Huh? Oh, he hello, Mr. Burns. Got you packed in with the baggage, huh? Oh, I don't mind that. Nice and lonely in here, huh? Yes. You like to be alone, don't you? Sometimes. Smoke? No, thanks. I have my pipe. Okay. Pop. Yes? Something I want to talk to you about. Well? It's about that wallet you lost. Oh? According to an identification card that was in it, your real name is Corey, and you used to be a bank teller in Cleveland. Now, look, Mr. Burns. Let me finish. I talked on a phone this afternoon to a pal of mine who lives in Cleveland. You see, I figured it was worthwhile finding out why you changed your name and hooked up with a Carney. Now, see here, My I... pal called me back and gave me the answer. Seems you left the bank owing him a little. About $9,000. Is that right? Yes. That's a lot of potatoes, Pop. Where you got it stashed? I haven't got it. Huh? I spent every cent of it. Now, wait a minute. That's the truth, Mr. Burns. I took that money only because my wife was desperately ill. Every cent went for her doctor bills. When she died, well, instead of doing what was right and confessing my guilt, I I ran away. Look, lay off the hearts and flowers, will you? Where's the dough? I just told you. And, Mr. Burns, I'm glad you found me out. I'm sick and tired of running away. I, I want you to turn me in. Who cares about turning you in? I want that nine grand. Now, stop giving me them routines and get it up. I swear to you, I haven't got it. What's in that little bag? Huh? What? That one there. Anything besides your clothes? I haven't got the 9,000. 
All I've got in this bag is $200. I saved it to make partial restitution to the bank. Let me see. No, you keep away from now, that. Let now, let go of me, you will you? keep away, I oh, said. I threw what you... Now we'll see what's in the bag. Ah, you were telling the truth. All right, Pop, what have you really got to do? Answer me. Come on, eh? Pop. Holy. Turn in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI protects national security. Now let's hear from a typical American worker who has attained greater personal security. It sure was a red-letter day when the boss signed up for complete group insurance protection. Man works better when he's got peace of mind. Well, you certainly get plenty of peace of mind from complete group coverage, for that takes in life insurance, accident and sickness insurance, and a retirement income plus hospital, medical, and surgical benefits for yourself and your wife and children, all in one package from the Equitable Life Assurance Society, and no medical examination to get it. One thing stumps me, though. It's how little that package costs. Well, your employer pays a part of the cost. Also, since he employs a number of workers, you get the benefit of what you might call the wholesale price for insurance. It sure was a bargain for me last winter. A bad case of the flu really had me down. Doc Brady even had my chest x-rayed. Those bills would have set me back for a long time. But they were all paid for by my group insurance. You know, group insurance was originated by the Equitable Life Assurance Society in 1911. Thomas I. Parkinson, president of the Equitable Society, says, group insurance is the most inspiring life insurance development of our time. If your company does not have group insurance, or if your company's group program is incomplete, your management can get in touch with the nearest Equitable Life Assurance Society office. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, The Honest Embezzler. The law, as we have molded it in 170 years, is not an impersonal, harsh set of rules written by vindictive men. It has compassion, and the quality of its mercy is available to all. Running away is the foolhardy course, for, as tonight's case from the files of your FBI proves, the cloak of justice affords more warmth, even to the criminal. Tonight's file continues at the Cleveland Field Office the day after the brutal slaying of the elderly bank embezzler on the carnival train. FBI Special Agent Jim Taylor is just sitting down at his desk when... Uh, Jim, I've been looking for you. Well, what about, Ralph? The resident agent up in Lansing phoned while you were out. Yes. He did as you asked him. He set up a surveillance at the general delivery window at the post office, but so far, no results. Mm -hmm. The local police are cooperating with him. They checked hotels, rooming houses, tourist camps... But no one of Corey's description has turned up. Well, I think I have a good lead. On where to find Corey? Yes. Now, as you know, he stayed in 20 cities for exactly one week at a time. Yes. Well, I did some research on what possible type of work would take him to each of those places. And what'd you come up with? A traveling carnival. So? Their playing dates coincided with each place that Kerry had had his newspaper sent. That should cinch you, then. I would think so, yes. Are you going up to Lansing? No, I'm sure the resident agent there can handle it. I'll get him on the phone, give him the name of the carnival... Then it should be just a matter of going out there and picking up Mr. Corey. Hurry, 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 hurry. 
Larry at Jimmy Chance, your last chance to catch this performance of the biggest show in the midway. See the sensational Princess Lily to a breathtaking fire dance. See the lovely Dolores, the Sultan's favorite. It's girls, 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 so hurry, 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 hurry. That does it, folks. The show is starting. Next performance in exactly half an hour. Marty. Marty. Oh, hiya, Lily. Why aren't you backstage? I'm not on for five minutes yet. Come here. I want to talk to you. Okay, sweetheart. What's on your mind, kid? Did you hear about Pop? Yeah, I took a potter, huh? Marty, what happened to him? Well, how should I know? Did you scare him away? Oh, now, wait, baby. I gave you my word I'd lay off the guy, didn't I? Yeah. Well, I kept it. Honest? Of course. I probably wanted to move on, it's all. Oh, still awful funny. Look, kid, you're on in a couple of minutes. You better get backstage. <laughs> Any word from Lansing, Jim? Yes, Ralph, and it isn't good. What happened? Well, our resident agent went out to the grounds. He talked to the owner. Yes? He was told a man answering to Corey's description had worked with the show. He'd been a ticket taker at one of the attractions, but he suddenly disappeared. Yeah, that sounds pretty convenient. Yes, I know. However, some of the other employees around the show verify the story. You think they could be covering for him? That's possible, yes. Under what circumstances did he disappear? Well, he took the special train with the rest of the troop from Fort Wayne. Uh -huh. Seems that he slept in the baggage car. But when the show arrived in Lansing, he was gone. Now, of course, he could have gotten off any place along the route. What stops did the train make? Well, that's being checked now. Well, Jim, where do you go from here? Well, I've just been figuring that. I think I may have the answer. What is it? Corey was a ticket taker for one of the shows, so his job must be open now. Yes? I'm going to see if I can get permission from the boss to go up to Lansing and apply for his position. And do some inside work? Right. Our resident agent can't do that. They already know him up there now. You ever been around a carnival, Jim? Well, when I was in college, I worked for a circus during summer vacation. <laughs> Trapeze artist? No. <laughs> Peanut vendor. <laughs> but that should be background enough for me to find out all I want to know. Special Agent Hunter. Hello, Ralph. This is Taylor. Hello there, Jim. You up in Lansing? Yep, and I got the job. I'm now head ticket taker for a little attraction that features none other than Princess Lily, the flame dancer, and Dolores, the Sultan's favorite. But so Jim, far, I'm in a... I was just going to try to contact you. What for, Ralph? You can stop looking for Mr. Corey. What do you mean? His body was found beside the railroad tracks about 60 miles outside of Fort Wayne. So? Well, I guess his trip was a waste of time. I'm not so sure that it was. Why not? From the preliminary information that we've received, there's a suspicion that Corey might have been murdered. Really? Yes. From the condition of Corey's body and the position in which it was found, the medical examiners say it's very possible Corey was dead before he left the train. Ralph, did he have any money on him? Only a dollar and 20 cents in change. Well, that makes it look like robbery. Right. And if Corey was robbed, that would put the case under FBI jurisdiction. Well, as long as I'm on the grounds, I'll stay on, see what I can dig up. Right. Where do you think you'll start? Well, his best friend with this show was a woman called Princess Lily. I think I'll start by talking to her. Well, Miss Fenton? Yeah? May I come in? Oh, you. Yeah, come on in. I understand this goes with my job. What's that? Bringing you coffee. Oh, thanks. Old Pop used to do this, didn't he? That's right. That's too bad about him, isn't it? You mean he's leaving the show? No. No, about his body being found. What are you talking about? Oh, well, haven't you heard? No. Well, one of the boys out front just told me. He was found beside the railroad tracks about 60 miles outside of Fort Wayne. Oh, no. Yeah. According to the story I heard, they seemed to think he was murdered. Murdered? Yes. The FBI's working on the case right now. I knew it. What did you say? Nothing. Billy. Yeah. Look, honey, I... Oh, I didn't know you had company. Look, uh, you, will you clear out of here? I want to talk to Marty alone. Sure. We'll get moving, will you, Mac? Okay. Glad you got rid of him, honey. I wanted... Marty. Yeah? I just heard something about Pop. No kidding. His body was found by the railroad tracks out of Fort Wayne. His 
body. That's right. Oh, that's tough. Poor old guy. Save that. What do you mean? You told me you hadn't bothered Pop, that you'd let him alone. That's right. You said you weren't going to dig up why he left that bank in Cleveland. I didn't. You're a liar. What? You got a telegram about an hour ago, which from your pal in Cleveland. How do you know? Because they opened it and read it. You had no right to do that. So I read it anyway. He wanted to know what luck you had with the information he gave you. That was on an entirely different matter. Don't give me that. You went to Pop on that train, didn't you? You told him what you knew about him. You know you're crazy. No, no, I know how you operate. If Pop was murdered, you're the one that gave it to him. Cut out that talk. Well, you're not going to get away with it. The FBI is on the case, and I'm going to go and tell them the whole story. You what? I'm going to give them the whole rundown on you and Pop right from the beginning. You ain't telling nothing. Let go of me. Shut up. No! Leave her alone, Burns. What? Let go of her. Keep out of this. Okay, mister, if that's how you want it. She doesn't have to go to the FBI, Burns. The FBI is here. I'm a special agent. What? Now, miss, suppose you tell me that story. Martin Burns was tried and convicted of murder in the state of Michigan and was sentenced to life imprisonment. Stated as simply as possible, tonight's case from the files of your FBI offers merely another proof that crime does not pay. That statement has been repeated by your FBI at every opportunity through every medium at their disposal since the Bureau was first founded. But for some strange reason, Strange because Americans are an adaptable people. The self-evident truth that crime can never be made a profitable career has been ignored. Ignored to such an extent that in the first six months of this year, there were 28% more murders in this country than in the first six months of 1945. But as the number of crimes has risen, so has the number of convictions. Convictions that came about because of alert police work by local police departments, state law enforcement officers, and your FBI. In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Now, one last word to business executives. Since group insurance was originated by the Equitable Life Assurance Society 35 years ago, thousands of employers have learned that group insurance means satisfied workers, builds loyalty and morale, decreases labor turnover, improves quality and quantity of production. Get all the facts and figures from an Equitable Society group insurance expert. Whether your employees are entirely uninsured or have only partial protection, get in touch with the nearest office or write direct to the New York home office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Fix election. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight's broadcast was directed by William M. Sweets. The music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is Your FBI is written and produced by Jerry Devine. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you the fixed election on This is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.